Good evening, everyone. Greetings to our audio and YouTube listeners. In our last conference, we proposed government by hagiocracy in the Garden of Innocence. We've been looking back to the ideal Garden of Innocence to gather the concepts of a past that didn't happen so that the lamb-like, meek of heart will know how to implement God's original ideals in the coming new earth, which in the book of Revelation has been promised to surely happen. In a previous conference entitled Garden Family, we saw that the garden was intended to develop into a beautiful city of God, not the Tower of Babel. The Old Testament prophets saw in vision that Babel and Babylon would be defeated and all the nations would stream toward Jerusalem, the city of peace. The apocalypse gives the gigantic dimensions of this city, which sits on a mountain dominating the earth. It's 12,000 stadia wide, 12,000 stadia long, and 12,000 stadia tall, not counting its mountain base. Now, a stadia was the standard 185 meter length of a stadium in ancient Greece and Rome. Try to imagine a city 1,380 square miles with its buildings reaching 1,380 miles into the sky. The atmosphere is approximately 40 miles high at most. This city reaches into outer space, symbolically touching heaven. This city, if it's a literal city, would cover more than half the states in the United States, or all of Europe, or most of China or India, and no planes could fly past it. There is no mountain on the planet large enough to support this towering city, which makes the Tower of Babel look like a joke. The Apocalypse is a book of symbols to instruct us about spiritual realities. In my Thursday night seminar on the Apocalypse, we'll soon be talking about the temple-like structure of this enormous city and the symbol of its adornments, etc. In this Tuesday night seminar, which we've entitled Beyond Consecration to Jesus Through Mary, we are focused on the role of the central female in the first book of the Bible and in the last book of the Bible. If you take away the main actress, you carry off the story. Nothing remains but a pile of props and some funny characters dressed up in animal costumes. The Genesis Garden cast includes a talking snake, a variety of tame animals, and a man without clothes, and a woman who likes snakes. The cast in the Apocalypse features a blood-spewing serpent, seven-headed beasts, and other multi-eyed creatures, a man in a white robe riding on a white horse, and a pregnant woman in hard labor. When the first woman got her lines wrong, the curtain went down, the gates closed, and we never got to see the end of the play. The last woman is a sky woman, engaging with a snake in the sky, and then we see a city in the sky. Today we are living in sky technology. We depend on cell towers and satellites to run our businesses. We use rockets to defend our homelands and the sky is the highway for a great deal of our traveling and freight transportation. The apocalypse raises the garden story to a new dimension. It's our dimension. It's a parable, not a myth. The symbols stand for real things. A new earth is coming. The serpent doesn't win. The earth belongs to its maker, who wants the original plan to be fulfilled. The garden story will be resumed. The new Eve is not going to get her lines wrong. She will succeed in the role where the first Eve failed. How do we know that? Because it's the same woman who stood faithfully by the tree of Calvary near the new Adam on the sixth day of the week. That is, the good sixth day we call Good Friday. Everyone rested on the seventh day. Jesus rose on the eighth day, the first day of a new creation week for those who acknowledge Christ as Lord. The next part of the drama is about the climax on the great day when all the earth will acknowledge that Yahweh is God and Jesus is Lord. Many people today are rightly concerned about a world government that will not acknowledge God or God's laws. A new earth modeled on the Garden of Innocence would be governed by holy persons, people who revere God, 
In a recent conference, we considered how Ezra and Nehemiah and the Maccabees attempted to institute a hagiocracy even while King Nebuchadnezzar, Alexander the Great, and then the Roman Caesars were ruling large portions of the Earth's population. The apocalypse envisions a time when people who love virtue will be in command, not in obscure pockets of the earth, but in the majority of nations. The old-fashioned meaning of minister is a person who serves. In the new earth, public ministers will see themselves as servants of God, servants of God's people. When we speak of world government, we are talking about the principles that underlie government in the world. If might makes right in most governments, then that's a principle. If paying for services with borrowed money is going on in most of the Earth's governments, then that's a world government principle. If wasting and abusing natural resources is happening in most countries, then that's another world government principle. Now, it could be that a great Antichrist figure will rise up and he will be hailed as a leader of the world and all the nations will unite under his government, and then a leader on a white horse will arise, and he will oppose this one world government. Then there will be a battle with bombs and bullets, and the end result will be a one world government by a hagiocracy. So either way, we end up with one set of leadership for the world, maybe. But don't hold your breath. Let's remember Psalm 22, quote, And all the families of the nations shall worship before him. God likes variety. Pope St. John Paul rejoiced in the variety of cultures when he traveled throughout the world. The Holy Trinity is not made up of three identical persons. Equal, yes. Identical, far from it. I don't think a one world government would please the Lord. The Trinity revels in the unique gifts they have bestowed on nations, persons, and even geographical landscapes. People would need leaders who are attuned to their language and culture. One size garment will fit nobody. Miss America pageants supposedly represent the ideal, perfect women, so it made a lasting impression on me as a teenager when I was told that that year not one contestant matched the average height and weight of those 50 ideal women. All were considered beautiful, but no two were alike. So God finds beauty in many nations. The hagiocracy of the garden proposes principles. It will be up to each nation in the family of nations to implement the principles in their circumstances. What we learn from the fall in the garden and from the battle in the apocalypse is that the enemy of holy government engages directly with a woman. When the serpent tricked Eve, hagiocracy was defeated. In the book of Revelation, we see a huge red serpent using all his artillery, not primarily against the riders on white horses, but against one small woman and her offspring. If he can defeat that woman, he's won the game. This entire seminar has been devoted to understanding the new Eve, the Blessed Virgin Mary. We want to know why she is so important in our present generation and why she wants us to be consecrated to her, and how to live that consecration fruitfully. Women have an important place in a holy government. As we saw last week, hagiocracy has three governing bodies which correspond to the persons of the Holy Trinity, executive fathers, judicial mothers, and legislative sons. In many respects, this resembles the ideals of our own republic, which strives to protect the equal dignity of every person. The United States Constitution presents a trifold balance of powers, an executive branch, a judicial branch, and a legislative branch. In our reflections on the garden, we saw that the candidates had to be approved by the people. A democratic election process corresponds to the garden for the executive and legislative branches. The judicial appointment process also resembles the garden because the candidates are not elected by the general populace, but appointed by the leaders. The ideal is to choose worthy judges, not judges who strive for the popular office by campaigning. In the garden of innocence, the judges are chosen with care, hand-picked on merit, because they are the beloved wives. 
The entire judicial branch is feminine. G.K. Chesterton greatly appreciated feminine gifts. His writings are full of witty yet poignant remarks, quoting What's Wrong with the World, published in 1910. It is quite certain that the skirt means female dignity, not female submission. It can be proved by the simplest of all tests. When men wish to be stately, impressive, as judges, priests, or kings, they wear skirts, the long trailing robes of female dignity. The whole world is under petticoat government, for even men wear petticoats when they wish to govern. Kings and cassocks have passed away, but judicial robes remain. The judge has to cover over his own personality, as it were, to look beyond his personal aspirations and opinions. In most cultures, a lady covers over her figure with loose garments so as to let her integrity and wisdom shine forth as her most valued quality. Women who wear scanty clothing are sadly sending the unladylike message that their only value is skin deep. Proverbs 31, charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. The brooding dove in the Holy Trinity, the motherly, consoling, wise spirit, is the guide and model for the female judges. And is it not significant that the Holy Spirit is always veiled in mystery, without a clear name or face? A woman hides behind the name of her husband to be the driving spirit in the family, the hidden engine thrust behind the scenes, filling husband and children with enthusiasm and confidence. Her self-fulfillment is the joy she experiences in keeping the family united in its ideals. The woman is the bond. There is no trinity if there are two fathers and one son, or two sons and one father. They cannot act as one unit without the unique person who is their driving spirit, who whirls around them and between them. Allow me to quote from the angel's prayer to the trinity in the approved apparition at Marian Free, Germany in 1946. Hail to you, Spirit of the Eternal One, forever giving forth holiness, acting from all eternity in God. O stream of fire from the Father to the Son, O raging storm blowing strength and light and fervor into the members of the body eternal, unending fire of love, creative Spirit of God in the living ones, red stream of fire from the ever-living one to the mortals. King James of England instituted the custom of having judges ride a circuit each year to hear cases, rather than forcing everyone to bring their cases to London. The young United States followed this model with circuit judges who rode through their districts hearing cases. Even the Supreme Court judges did so for the first hundred years. The ideal was for the judge to be familiar with the people. We still have the term circuit courts. Envision spirit-filled justices blowing strength and light and enthusiasm for the law between the executive branch, which must enforce laws with justice and compassion, and the legislative branch, which must enact particular laws so as to implement in a practical manner the general law of the Constitution. The Supreme Court passes judgment on the lawmakers and the law enforcers. With corrupt judges, the nation gets away with murder, extortion, and chaos. Patriotism dies. The national spirit dies. Every citizen lives for himself. The appointment of keen judges is vital to a nation's well-being. In a garden society, the role of a judge fell naturally to women. In the Old Testament, women judges were revered. Deborah was famous for her integrity. In one of our Native American tribes, the women had the right to depose any man serving on the council if the women judged that the man wasn't worthy. In some places in South America, a boy can't join the school sports team unless he is named by the girls. The trinity of the family operates directly at the level of individual human persons, the father, the mother, and the firstborn son who represents all the offspring. A nation is a family of families, so it operates at the level of social persons. Each government branch is a social body, and a body must have a head and a face. 
A leaderless body can't coordinate itself in a direction to function as a unit. In the Garden City, the executive branch has its first minister, Adam, high priest and king of the earth. The legislative branch, or in British parlance, the House of Lords, has its chancellor or speaker, who is also an elder or bishop in this nation of priestly people. And finally, the judicial branch has its Supreme Court justice, or better, Gebira Eve, the queen mother, who presides with her son in the royal court. In the Garden of Innocence, the first mother was espoused to the first father. The conception of their son, Ben Adam, was the fruit of Eve's virginal obedience. Her son and savior appeared fully grown and walked through the garden, revealing to them the identity of God as a trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The first Eve was the Gibira, queen mother of the Son of God and Son of Man.